Hello, everyone. My name is Iris Anastasiadou, and welcome. Uh, I am a researcher in public international law here at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. So our focus uh, today is the critically important topic uh, of homelessness and human rights. It has been estimated that over 1.6 billion people globally lack adequate housing. According to Shelter, at least 271,000 people are homeless in England today. International human rights law and the fight against homelessness are, or rather should be, inseparable. Today, our esteemed panel will discuss how international human rights law can inform a comprehensive approach to combat homelessness. There will be an emphasis on the importance of cooperation between governments, international organizations, NGOs, and communities to safeguard the rights uh, and the dignity of those experiencing homelessness in an effort to move closer to a world where adequate housing is a universal human right. I would like to take a moment to pay tribute to a, our generous sponsor, the law firm Baker Botts. Um, without their support, uh, this event and the critically important work that it represents would not be possible. Thank you, Dr. Escobar. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to extend our appreciations to Tam Latimer uh, for stepping in for Vicky Spratt uh, to chair the panel as unfortunately she could not be here with us today. Also, thank you to our speakers, uh, Jamie Burton, Stephanie Lovegrove, and Koldo Kasla. Um, finally, I would also like to express our deepest gratitude to uh, Mr. Balakrishnan Rajagopal, uh, who has graciously agreed to deliver the closing address, and to Lord Bird for delivering the keynote address. Um, finally, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to our co-organizers from BICO, Dr. Jean-Pierre Gaucci and Katie Lines, who have dedicated their time to make this event possible, uh, as well as our events team, Bradley, Liam and Carmel. Now, it is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Lord Bird. Um, it was through our chance meeting and his visionary perspective that the idea for this gathering had its genesis. His dedication and commitment to creative positive change is at the very least is inspiring. Lord Bird was born into poverty and brought up in care. His life journey uh, has included spells as prisoner, artist, and printer. Now an activist, publisher and crossbench member of the House of Lords, Lord Bird is the driving force behind the Big Issue Group, which includes the world's, world's most uh, successful street magazine, The Big Issue, and its social investment arm, Big Issue Invest. Lord Bird is a business leader with an outstanding record of uh, using enterprise as a force for social change in dismantling the root causes of poverty, and in Parliament, he focuses on poverty and homelessness prevention. He's currently co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on business response to social crises and has the well-being of future generations bill. Without further ado, I would invite Lord Bird now to deliver, deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really do not like what Iris has just said um, because she's stolen all my words. So I've got no story to tell. So why don't you just carry on and I can go and see my daughter in Norwich. How about that? I can get away early. No, um, it's very interesting for me because when I met Iris, I was we met on the train and we just fell into conversation. And uh, Iris was saying how she was working uh, in the human rights area. And I, human rights and homelessness in the UK are never really put together. They don't do it. I mean, I'm talking about the practitioners. I'm talking about the people who run the organizations like shelter crisis and all that. And even within the big issue, we never really talk about human rights and um, homelessness, but we do talk about the human right 
of people being allowed to sleep on the streets. So I have had many arguments in Europe, in Asia, in Tokyo, and in the United States, where people, comfortable people, people who are living in homes, who are often liberal-minded, will start saying, when somebody likes me, like me, says, we should not allow anybody to sleep on the streets. And they immediately think I'm some kind of crypto fascist that is defy that is taking from people a universal basic right, which is to sleep on the streets and be destitute and probably die 10, 15, 20 years before anybody else. So those are the only debates that I've ever had about human rights. The right to harm yourself, the right to drink yourself to death, the right to suffer from drug addiction and to sleep out on the streets and beg. And there are always people protecting the right of people to beg. Isn't it wonderful? Not their right not their human rights to actually be given the opportunity of moving away from the streets. And an insistent that society looks upon those people who sleep in the parks and in the doorways as people who are mentally ill, because it is a mental illness. If you're not mentally ill when you arrive on the streets, I assure you, within a very, very short space of time, you will be mentally ill. It can take two or three days when your life will change, your body will change, your body clock will change, and everything about your life will change. And it will be a slow, quick, slow, quick, depending on whether you have any breaks off the streets, where you will actually begin to lay down the foundation stones of an early death and a stupid relationship with drugs and drink. When I say stupid, I mean mind-numbing. When I started The Big Issue in 1991, um, a few months afterwards, I was walk walking through uh, Covent Garden and I saw a young girl who was probably about 15 or 16 and she came up and she offered me certain services as long as I gave her a £10 note. And I said, well, you know, well, I was a bit rude. I said, what the F in hell are you doing? If you know what the F means. What the F in hell are you doing? You know, you should be at home or whatever. Where are you? And she told me the sub story about how she'd been driven out of home because she had declared to her parents she was a lesbian. So there you have somebody who's on the streets because of their sexuality. And then what happens, the next time I see her, she's climbing out of a window in one of these projects that are there. I think it was called Centerpoint. And she's climbing out of a window and she's dropping down. Uh, and this is, you know, only a matter of weeks later. And I said, what are you doing? This is about three in the morning. And she says, oh, I'm going off to earn a bit of money because my boyfriend, she got a boyfriend, wonderful having a boyfriend. We all need boyfriends or girlfriends. Sorry, her girlfriend was on the gear. On the gear, meaning they took it in the arm. So she went off and prostituted herself to pay for the habits of her girlfriend. Now, that is a reality. That's a horrible reality. So when somebody likes me, like me, comes along and says, you should not be allowed to be on the streets. You should not be allowed as a child or a young woman to abuse yourself. And that actually we need some tough love here and we need to be a bit draconian and society needs to take responsibility for people in need, especially people who are suffering from the mental illnesses that go with drink, drugs, and all the other things like that. So anyway, 
Are, are you all right with that? Am I shouting too loud? have a problem i used to be a member of a revolutionary organization and we talked all the time like that to each other <laughs> when i was a marxist engelist leninist trotskyist we were mad as anything we would talk to each other in the bus queue and doing all the gesticulation so forgive me that's the only form of tutoring i've ever had anyway so the point is if you look at the human rights the human rights that uh, you run into, the human right to actually sleep in the streets, because there's people like me, not many, who want to deny you that right because we want to give you another right. We want to give you the right where the government and the state takes responsibility for you because largely you will be self-destroying yourself and nobody should have the right to destroy themselves in public or even in private slow suicide no one should have that right it's all based i have to say i mean even though iris has stolen all of my my hello there you're a bit late you know you you, knew, you know you have to sign a form afterwards and yeah I'm joking. Anyway, so so the thing is, my my, my uh, attitude towards homelessness is totally different from virtually anybody else I've ever met. And the reason for that was because I was born into a London Irish slum uh, called Notting Hill. Uh, in It's now, it's still a slum, but it's an expensive slum. You've got to really have a shed load of money to live there now. I mean, the house I was born into would probably cost 10 million now, even though we had two rooms for a few shillings a week. I was born into a London Irish family. My parents, my mother was a barmaid. My father was a laborer, a builder's laborer. We had violence. We had uh, domestic violence. We had hunger. We had all sorts of stuff. And we had an enormous amount of racism. I was taught as a boy, uh, to hate everybody, the English, black people, Indians, Jews, everybody. And that's what I was taught. That was my mind forged manacles. I was blessed by the fact that when I was seven, we were made homeless, the whole family, all the boys. And we ended up in a Catholic orphanage where they fed us. And suddenly we grew, which was something that we didn't quite get much. And we had baths and we had underwear. Very important underwear when you're a child, especially when you haven't had any before and when you haven't had any blankets and you haven't had baths and all that. So anyway, I went through that and then I came out and I was a complete raving nutter at the age of 10. And I started beating up teachers and starting fires and daubing swastikas and doing all sorts of antisocial stuff and stealing cars and bikes and breaking into offices and all that. And I spent the next seven, eight years in and out of institutions. And every institution I went into, I learned something. So at the age of 16, I learned to read and write in a boys' prison. So the very posh guy that you see before you now is posh largely because every time I did something wrong, the state pulled me in, educated me, gave me skills, a bit of printing and all sorts of other skills like that. So I went through it and I was a rough sleeper. I used to sleep around here. I used to beg around here uh, as, a, as a young boy and as a young man. So therefore, when I became a Marxist, Engelist, Leninist and Trotskyist, I got rid of all my racism. I got rid of all my chauvinism. And I became an upstanding, righteous person who wanted to fight against ignorance. Unfortunately, my Marxism didn't last very long, largely because the Marxist party was full of people, largely middle class people whose parents didn't like them. And they felt, you know, kind of inferior. And maybe one day they found their parents loved them again. And then they stopped being Marxist. I found it a very classist 
And I was a working class geezer, a bit rough, and I didn't fit in, never fitted in. Anyway, the long and the short of it was I became a printer. And then when I was about 40, I realized that I'd been through so many experiences that I had to find a way of sharing those with other people. I re-met a guy who I'd met when I was hiding from the police when I was 21 in Edinburgh, and I'd re-met him when I was 40, and he'd become a multimillionaire. And that multimillionaire gave me the money to start The Big Issue. When I started The Big Issue, I started it on the basis that the first thing I would not do is be sentimental about the poor. There are so many people in the world who will, will cry for the poor, but won't actually think to get them out of poverty. I found I was at war with the 501 homeless organizations in London alone that gave homeless people every basic right, a place to sleep, a place to wash. They gave out sandwiches, condoms, a shoulder to cry on, but not one of them gave homeless people the chance, like this guy I just met now in the park called Paul, and I bought a copy of The Big Issue. Giving him the right to make money, earn his own money, so that he could begin to make some sensible decisions about his life. I'm a 77-year-old man, perfectly formed. The only thing going wrong is the throat. I just talk too much. Hmm. How are we doing for time? What does that mean? 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Two hours. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So anyway, so, so I was at war with this kind of ideological commitment to the poor that didn't get them out of it. And I do find that most of the efforts that we expend in and around poverty is spent on trying to make the poor as comfortable as possible. Very little of it is spent on breaking people free of poverty. And very little is spent on preventing poverty. And that to me is one of the principal reasons why having started the big issue, having built the big issue movement all over the world, we're in 54 different countries. And starting social businesses, there's 501 social businesses that the big issue have invested in social businesses all over the UK, and now we're moving to Africa and we'll be moving to Asia in the next few years. And these are about creating social businesses that give people work, education, social opportunity, so that they can get themselves out of poverty with the aid of the organization. So we did all that, but when I got to about the, I was still an old git, I was probably in my late 60s when I decided that what I was going to do, because I was sick of people saying, oh, Johnny Bird, you, you really do know how to think outside the box. People love patting you on the back because they love people like me, you know, people who come from poverty to parliament or poverty to purpose, as I talk about it. So when I got sick of people saying, Johnny Bird, you're great at thinking outside the box. I thought to myself, the reason they're saying that is because the box isn't working. So I decided to get in the box. And there was a, a system created by Tony Blair where you could become a people's peer. All you had to do was apply. You would apply and no one applied for you. So that young boy there in 20 years time, maybe he could become a peer. All he's got to be is over 23. Anybody here can apply for a peer, as long as you're not a, a, a nun dom, as long as you're not living in Cyprus and working over here or what, I don't know. Anyway, so I became, I got into the parliament 
And I got into Parliament to do one thing, and one thing alone, and that was to dismantle poverty, not to make the poor comfortable. Other people are doing that all the time. You go into the House of Lords, you go into the House of Commons, you go to all these charities, and they're all really suffering because the poor are suffering. But where is the analytical thinking about creating new methodologies of thinking and social delivery? Where is that? It's not there. It is all about emergency and all that. 80% of all the money spent in and around poverty in the world, 80% of it is spent on emergency and coping with poverty. Not with prevention and not with cure. So anyway, I went in, and I am the loudest person in the House of Lords. If you do go there, you'll hear me. And uh, I do like to be the person who is there simply to be known as the man who will only leave the House of Lords in a wooden box or hopefully before ending up in a wooden box, he will have helped to dismantle poverty and create mechanisms for social change. We are working on something now called a Ministry of Poverty. And if you want, I can give you out a little leaflet which will just outline the my colleague here, Gurum has got them. And it'll outline what we're trying to do. We're creating a ministry of poverty because nobody in Britain is really bringing together the fight to create an end to poverty. Anyway, back to human rights. I don't know an awful lot about human rights. When I spoke to I Iris on the train, I think I was kind of pretending I knew a bit more. But the, but the end of the day for me, can we say to the government, which is what I'm looking for, that it is a human right for people to be taken off the streets and put in a place of safety and put in a place of where their health and their mental well-being will be looked after? Up until 1960, 61, in this country, and I remember this because I was a 15-year-old boy running around, begging, telling everybody, oh, my mother's just died, trying to get money out of them, and then later on in the day, my father died, and then the next day they died again. But I was running around begging, and then I saw a policeman, then I would hide. Why would I hide? Because then they had what was called the, the Vagrancy Act. And what they had was NFA, no fixed abode. And if you were found begging and you were found sleeping rough, they would arrest you and they would put you in prison. A young boy like me would be put into a reformatory. And then what happened was the magistrates decided that anybody coming before them for begging or sleeping rough they wouldn't, they'd kiss, kick it out, case dismissed. So suddenly, in 1960-61, just before the swinging 60s of London, suddenly you had an increase of people sleeping on the streets because the law was not being enforced. Now, I don't want the Vagrancy Act used again, it's still on the statute books. Next year, it's 200 years since it was put on. It's a draconian law that describes people who sleep around as criminals and mentally retarded and all sorts of stuff like that. So I'm not defending that, but I'm saying I know a period when it was illegal to sleep on the streets and you didn't have the destitution. The destitution was somewhere in institutions. I would not want to go back to that. And if anybody ever accuses me of trying to be Victorian and picking people up and saying, right, we're going to look after you, whether you need to be looked after or not, I'm saying, no, that's not the case. We have to create therapeutic communities. 
We have to create places where we take the illness out of people, the drink problems, the drug problems, the mental health problems, the mental well-being problems. We need to invest in that. So my big argument is society does not take care of the most vulnerable people that are on the streets. And we need to address that. And the best way, in my opinion, is by going on about how it is a human rights abuse to let people live and die on our streets. Thank you. I think we've got time for a few questions. Haven't we? Do we have any questions? Or observations? Yes. Uh, well, Bert, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for the opening remarks. Um, there are a couple of things you said. One of the things I want to ask you about specifically is when you refer to the issue being mechanisms of social change. In other words, trying to focus on creating mechanisms of social change. How do you see us moving forward between now and let's say the next 10 years? Well, I think uh, I think the real problem, the reason why I'm calling for a, a ministry of, of poverty, which is not a very nice word and most governments don't want, the Labour government wants to occupy the office of state in the rooms and in the structures that it is existing. And the Conservative Party want, don't want anything that re, recalibrates the, the government because they believe it's an increase of big government. If you've got 50% of our national health budget spent on trying to keep the poorest among us healthy, if you've got 50% of the BMA telling us, British Medical Association, telling us that 50% of people who present themselves with a uh, with cardiac arrest are people suffering from food poverty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 40% of all government income is spent on, 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 um, on poverty, on the damages brought to society from poverty. When you get all of these, you there are there is arithmetical or mathematical reasons why you would address this. There are moral reasons why you are, but it's not being done. And until we actually change the mindset, not just of the government, but of you, of our universities, our universities are full of people, and I'm not being rude to them. They're full of people who are, who are really upset about poverty. But they, when you say to them, so what are you going to do about it? They're going to go and give money to people in the street or, or they're going to join a, a, a food line. The only reason you need a food line is because you have not addressed the reasons why people fall in poverty. So what we need is we need a brighter, cleverer world. Oxbridge and all those people in my opinion, when I speak at Oxbridge, I speak and I can realise that none of them philosophically have faced up to how do you dismantle poverty. And this is a class issue. This is a culture issue. This is a philosophical issue. This is an issue that involves all of us. So if you want my argument, until we can recalibrate our thinking around poverty, and, you know, I'm sitting there and I said to my my partners in this in the in the thing i said you know they say what are we trying to do i said well go and go and see the film oppenheim and see the stages at the early part when people say what are you doing and we said well I, i'm not quite sure all i know is we've got to get on with it and it is that the first thing i would do if if there was a ministry of poverty is have an audit what works what doesn't work where are the where in the world, anywhere in the world, there were thousands of examples of poverty prevention, poverty dismantlement. I am, I, I'm a father of five children. 
None of my children beg. None of my children have had to prostitute themselves. None of the, my children have had to sleep rough. Why? Because I built into them. I took them to ballet lessons. I took them skiing. No, not skiing. Uh, uh, sorry, I've never been skiing. What is it? Water skiing. I did all sorts of things. I took them to galleries. I enriched their lives. I made them socially aware. So that when they go into the workforce, when they go into the marketplace, they've got a job. I've done all that stuff. And we have to pass that enriching, that poverty prevention mechanism on. I, I, I despair of the way that we teach social intervention now, and I despair of the way in which we, you know, we have freshers fair and we say, what do you want to do? I know what, I want to look good. So what I'll do is I'll do a food line and I'll do this and I'll do that. You know, I mean, we're, we're going through one of the biggest arguments now in the Middle East. What is it all about? It's about poverty. Poverty and all of the extraneous things that come out of poverty. It's extraordinary the, the, the way in which poverty keeps popping up and changing the direction of history. Anyway, sorry, I'm sure I didn't answer because I never do. We have one question from the online audience, if I may. Oh, yeah. um, so it's a bit of a bold one. Um, they're asking because um, they volunteer with a crisis and they've had some co uh, conversations with rough sleepers. And some of them say that they have chosen this lifestyle. What is your response to that? Oh, yeah, but that's brilliant. Now, now for instance, it, it, choosing. Now, uh, I drink a lot of tea right? It's vile. I only like tea, which is undrinkable. I only like tea, which is, I mean, when my children and my wife look at it, they go, oh, geez. I mean, it's, it's like, I don't know what it's like drinking. It might be petroleum. And why am I doing that? Why am I drinking that? Because my mum gave me that when I was born. She put it in my bottle. She was a lovely Irish lady and believed that tea was apart from Guinness, the most important mm -hmm. elixir on, in life. So I got used to drinking tea. So I get used to it, you know, socialization through drink and all sorts of stuff like that. I have never met a rough sleeper who says, if you had a chance of doing other things where you could still keep your sense of purpose or whatever, I've never met a rough sleeper who would say, okay, I choose the street. They are saying largely, and this is another crime, they are largely saying, I don't want to go into a hostel because hostels are not safe. They're not places where, I mean, I know these hostels. I've slept in them myself when I was a boy. They were safe then. They're not safe now. Hostels and people don't want to be controlled but it's largely because they've got used to these kind of things you know when i used to go around thinking that people of a darker skin or a different religion were evil that you know i wasn't born with that that was socialization so i don't you know i don't accept the fact that people who are rough sleepers are making the decision they're on overdrive and most of us are on overdrive, I'm sorry to say. Most of us are doing, most of us have not fallen far from the tree. And we're just passing on some of the stuff that comes from previous generations. Thank you so much. One more question. Yeah, if, if we have uh, some time, you, you alluded that, um, to, to that earlier on. You talk about, first of all, the big issue going uh, to foreign places as well, all, all around the world. So there's a need in, in many places, obviously. Um, but you also alluded to looking at other systems. And because we're the British Institute of Comparative Law as well, I'm just wondering if there's any pointers or any idea that you have of a good model that has been adopted elsewhere that has kind of worked of what could be perhaps looked at here, perhaps in the, in the ministry you're suggesting? 
Well, you have to work out. Um, we invented this methodology called PEC, which is P E C C, and that is prevention, emergency, coping, and cure. So, if you actually look at that, and that covers everything. That covers what you do for your children or your parents did for you, which is the prevention and that what, what we need to extend to the poorest amongst us. If you look at, there's many good emergency uh, mechanisms or, or projects around the world, but they, they are never mainstream. They're kind of tried a bit here. Every government has what they call initiatives. So they take an initiative and they use it and then somebody else moves along, they try another initiative and the last one has not already been proved. So there's a, there is a, a tendency to look for bright sparkling beads that look good. But if you take, for instance, that something that started in the United States called Housing First, it started in a place called Bakersfield. And what it was, was this, this guy who was just an ordinary psychologist and he started working and he worked logically he said look he said homeless people are here and they're all over the place and there's about 25 sorts uh 25 forms of social support for them whether it's somewhere to sleep somewhere to eat a shoulder to cry on but but there's no connectivity there's no concatenation it does not come together so this guy put together a model and it dismantled poverty in Bakersfield. The police were involved, the ambulance were involved, the schools were involved, the businesses, and it brought them all in. And then this was moved on to other cities. And in the end, the Finnish did it. And the Finnish, the fin, the fin, people in Finland are doing a brilliant job in doing, we're trying it over here. It's not working as well as it worked in other places. And I think that's largely because everybody's worried about the human rights of these people to still harm themselves. There's a bit of, in America, you know, you have to, you have to join up. And there's that kind of element of, of, of pushing. So there's, so, I mean, that's one of the, one of the, the things. Uh, I have seen incredible, uh, incredible changes. I, I worked in, in Los Angeles and I worked down in South Central in, in an area which was largely made up of African Americans. And what was so interesting there was virtually all of the young people, most of them coming out of the prison system, all they really wanted was a job. They didn't want any more uh, training, which was paid for by the government. People would train you and then leave and then you get another bit of training and and that was, and it never led to any social transformation. So what a number of people did, and I was one of them, is we gave people jobs. So giving somebody a job, even if the job is only for a short amount of time a week, work is one of the greatest manifestations of opportunity. But most people are saying, well, we've got to deal with the mental health. Best way of dealing with mental health is give you a purpose to get up in the morning. Lord Bird. Sorry. Apologies for interjecting. I know. I'm, I've been, I do go on a bit. <clears throat> no, no, not at all. I'm being told that we need to move on. But uh, just in relation, if we can stop at the point of mental health, because I was a mental health practitioner for a number of years, and if time permitting, perhaps we can return to mental health. Could I, could I just say, I'm, in spite of appearances, a very young father. So I have a 16-year-old daughter who lives in Norwich, and I do need to get there sometime so could you tell me when I can skedaddle, which is a good Irish term for leave? Whenever you would like. <laughs> oh, no, no, I but don't thank want you. to kind of curtail your... Thank you for being here then. And thank you for your speech. Um, and we may move on with the panel, yeah. if everyone well, agrees. So, so shall I? Is it all right Maybe. if I go? Um, it's entirely up to you. Obviously, yeah. we would like you to stay if you can, because there may be some questions from the audience and certainly from myself. But it's entirely up to you. We right. don't want to hold you back. I'm going to leave at five thirty. Okay, that's uh, that... that. Yeah, that's that's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry I've gone on too long. No, no, no. On the contrary. I'm also a stand-up comic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will have to come and watch you one time then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lord Bird.
Um, before I introduce the distinguished panelists that uh, I'm obviously sitting alongside or sitting, or sitting to my left, um, just a couple of words in relation to myself. Uh, firstly, I should thank Bikul and thank uh, Ms. Iris Anastasadiu for inviting me to honor this panel, sorry, inviting me to uh, moderate this panel discussion. It was done at fairly short notice today, but uh, uh, I feel very honored to do so. So um, um, just in relation to myself, I'm obviously a barrister, like uh, my colleagues on the left, uh, Stephanie Lovegrove, and of course, Jamie Burton, uh, King's Counsel. Um, in terms of my practice, uh, I uh, started off uh, prosecuting, defending in serious criminal cases. I was mainly a defense advocate. Uh, I was a jury advocate for a number of years. Um, my specialism was defense in serious fraud, but also I had a real interest in human rights. Um, and invariably human rights issues would arise in some of the cases I dealt with. And uh, in terms of human rights, I mean, my view as a practitioner is, of course, it's a fundamental right. And of course, where you can, as an advocate, especially as a defense lawyer, you try to, of course, safeguard your client's uh, position and their rights as best as possible. I also was a mental health practitioner whilst I was a criminal practitioner. And um, when it came to dealing with mental health law, certainly what Lord Bird said about uh, issues such as drugs and mental health issues. Um, when I used to go to the tribunal and then deal with section two, uh, section two applications or section three applications to get my client discharged so that we would literally want to try and persuade the tribunal to lift the section. Um, the very first time I did it, I lost. And being a typical advocate, being a typical lawyer, I wanted to find a way of actually winning. After that, I found some sort of formula, created some sort of formula where I was able to persuade the tribunal to lift the section. I can tell you this with my hand on my heart, quite literally. Every time the section was lifted, um, I felt terrible because I knew the right place for my client was actually um, to remain sectioned until they received the treatment or the care that they needed before they were discharged back into the community. Um, let me stop there. That's enough about me. Um, without further ado, let me please introduce the panelists. Uh, person sitting on my left is uh, Jamie Burton, King's Counsel, uh, Barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. Uh, Jamie is a public lawyer with expertise in judicial review and human rights. Uh, his main areas of practice are human rights, social and clinical care, housing, social security actions against the police. He has acted in several important cases which has actually led to the challenge of central government uh, cuts to public services pursuant to the Equality Act 2010. Um, he uh, appears on a regular basis in the high courts, including the Supreme Court. Uh, Jamie is also head of Doughty uh, Street Community Care and Health Team and is a leading authority on the CARE Act 2014. Um, Jamie also acts for claimants and defendants and regularly advises public authorities on their policies and procedures in relation to the statutory and human rights obligations. Uh, separately, he is also chair and co-founder of Just Fair, a registered charity that works exclusively on human rights issues, uh, particularly economic, social, and cultural rights, and uh, with significant impact on public debate on human rights in UK as a whole. Um, so welcome, Jamie Burton, uh, please. Uh, the next person who sits, uh, sorry, the person who sits, let me say this again, the person who sits next to Jamie is Stephanie Lovegrove. She's also a fellow barrister. She's based at four to five Gray's Inn Square. Um, Stephanie is a highly experienced barrister who represents and advises in some aspects of housing, uh, commercial landlord and tenant, and property law, acting in cases in the first year tribunal, property chambers, and also the county court, up until, uh, sorry, up to and including Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. Um, she acts for both landlords and tenants, local authorities and residents. She is also a former assistant deputy editor of the Encyclopedia of Housing Law. Uh, she is also author of a practical guide to unlawful eviction harassment and has written several articles on legal developments in the field of housing local government law. Uh, she attends roundtable meetings when she can with the housing minister, uh, Mark Prisk, and in 2012, sorry, 2012 concerning leasehold reform and has trained ex extensively on this and other cutting edge developments 
uh, in relation to landlord and tenant law. Uh, please welcome Stephanie Lovegrove. Um, and finally, uh, the gentleman who sits on the far left is Dr. Coldo Kassler. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Essex. Uh, Dr. Coldo Kassler is a senior lecturer in law, the University of Essex and director of the Human Rights Center Clinic. Uh, he leads the Human Rights Local Project at the Human Rights Center. And between 2017 and 2019, he was a research associate at the Institute of Health and Society of Newcastle University. Um, and between 2016 and 2019, he was the policy director of Just Fair. Uh, he holds a PhD in European and International Studies from King's College London, a Fulbright Human Rights from the University of Essex and, and a law degree from the University of Basque, the Basque Country. He has authored a number of publications, uh, The Rights of Property, Taking Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Seriously, and has co-edited books including European Social Charter, Commentary, Volume 3. Uh, please uh, also welcome Dr. Coldo Kassler. Um, that finishes with the introductions and the bios. And I think now what we need to do is to move on to the first presentation. And the first presentation, I believe, will be given by uh, Jamie. Is, it, is that correct? Is it, is it? Uh, yes. Well, that's what it says on this bit of paper. So that's, 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 that's you're right. Uh, OK. Um, OK. Well, then we're both on the same page then. <laughs> Uh, whether I call it a presentation or not, I'm not sure, but you know, some comments. Um, and sorry about the overlong bio, that's obviously taken straight from the website. I wasn't prepared for this talk, so apologies for that too. Um, well, Bert, can I just say that was genuinely fascinating, and you may uh, find this notion of you being somebody who thinks outside the box patronising in certain contexts. I, I certainly agree with the statement. I think you do think outside the box. I think it's incredibly refreshing to hear it. Please don't stop doing that. Um, and the point I really wanted to pick up on that I wholeheartedly agree with and indeed wanted to say something similar about when I when I spoke about this issue is having worked in the context of homelessness for all of my professional lives, it's the first thing I did as a barrister, I was going around county courts trying to avoid people being made homeless or get them accommodation when they were homeless. And what became incredibly frustrating for me and still is now is that there's this way in which we talk about homelessness is, is, is either a moral issue exclusively or an issue about personal behaviour. And we personalise the issue, whereas actually the, the elephant in the room is, is nearly always structural. It's always a structural reason why people inevitably end up unable to afford or access or otherwise live in adequate accommodation. And this comes within a context of where we have understood for decades now the importance of adequate housing to almost every other facet of somebody's life. It's just simply not credible to suggest people can readily enjoy a flourishing life uh, without having safe and adequate housing that they can access. And it's also like the most basic form of kind of material good we can all understand we've got to have some connection with. Like whatever your role in society, there must be somewhere where you can put your head down at night, you can build your life, build your family life, etc. So we understand these things both on an intellectual level and we probably understand them as, as human beings. And yet we have persisted with certain structural problems in connection with housing for decades now, fully aware that they tend to generate homelessness, uh, but persist nevertheless. And, uh, you know, I'm only I wanted to talk about two cases which seem to me to highlight something about that and then say something very briefly about two other issues I've been involved in. Cases. Uh, one is from 2008, so just to give you an idea of how old it is, and it was a case that went to the House of Lords, as it was then described, and it was about reforms introduced by the government of the day, which was a new Labour government, to housing benefit. And as you probably know, housing benefit is the mechanism whereby we facilitate people to access accommodation in the private rented sector that they can't otherwise afford. And it's a mechanism whereby we pay over money direct to private landlords um, so that they will provide their accommodation, if they choose to, to people who otherwise can't afford it themselves. And what the, what the issue was in that case was that the government changed the rules so that when you decided what the maximum amount was that somebody could receive on housing benefit, you judged that by reference to effectively the poorest parts of the city that they lived in. So you didn't take something across the board. You didn't look at the whole city and say, OK, what's the average amount for somebody to live in this city? Let's pay housing benefit about that rate. Now, you might think, well, that sounds like a perfectly sensible thing. You're just lowering the amount that we're actually paying to ensure people are accommodated. 
But the effect it had was really drastic because what it actually meant is you ended up pulling people who needed state support to accommodate themselves into the same areas and cities, which is something actually Britain has tended not to do over the years. In fact, I think it's been very good for social cohesion in this country that we haven't tended, like other countries, like France, for example, where there's a sort of ghettoization by deliberate policy. But indirectly, we started to create that. And that was the beginning of a policy agenda. We actually won the case in the House of Lords, but ultimately, you know, the law can only do so much to prevent politicians doing what they wanted to do. And what we've seen over time is that that policy really has been strengthened and strengthened to the, to the extent now that if you're reliant on housing benefit, it's almost impossible to find affordable accommodation in almost most cities, save for very small parts of it, which of course then drives everybody who doesn't have access to uh, often their own resources into the same areas, which brings together so many other structural problems. So we've seen that problem persist all the way through. And then the more recent case I did was kind of like watching that policy have its kind of inevitable, inexorable outcome, which is a case actually uh, last year, which concerned a policy that local authorities have of when they did have a duty to someone to provide them with accommodation, and that's only available in very restricted circumstances, that they had to find accommodation that was affordable for them. And affordability was judged by the same criteria. Would they be able to get housing benefit that would cover the rent? And of course, the answer in large parts of the southeast was no, we can't provide them accommodation because there simply isn't any that's affordable. So they literally just ship them all off to other parts of the country where accommodation still remains affordable. And it tends to be areas where the demand is low, where the availability of jobs is low, where public services are already under great stress. And you're uprooting people from their existing support networks and saying, if you want accommodation, you've got to go often, as was the case in the case that we, we were doing, two, 300 miles away to a part of the country where you have no connections. And frankly, your prospects of being able to get yourself off benefits, break your own poverty cycle, et cetera, would be diminished. And that was all because of a policy agenda that started, as I say, in 2008 and was carried all the way through, which meant we just don't make accommodation that's, uh, we don't make affordable accommodation available for people that we are actually trying to help. And that's a structural thing we, we, we could change overnight and we'd immediately prevent that problem from materializing. The other two things I wanted to talk about briefly, um, which are similarly structural, was um, Grenfell. Uh, you'll all be familiar with Grenfell. Um, I, I worked on the public inquiry in relation to Grenfell, which is uh, going to produce its, its final report very soon. And I just wanted to make one point about that. You'll all be familiar with it, but it, it goes directly to this issue, foreseeability. That what happened at Grenfell was, was in fact foreseen. It wasn't just foreseeable, objectively. In fact, it was foreseen. And yet it still was allowed to happen. And it is a, obviously an incredibly dramatic and very tragic example of what in fact is happening across the country all the time. Perfectly foreseeable, indeed foreseen consequences for people who are unfortunately, for structural reasons, unable to afford um, decent accommodation or for what for some other reason are deprived the basic necessities of life um, end up being confronted with very significant disadvantage and harm. It, 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 not all of them, but a significant number to such an extent that we know this is going to happen and yet we still don't address the problem. And the final one I wanted to talk about very briefly, and I'm sure my time will, will be up, is what happened during the pandemic, which I, 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 you're probably all familiar with too, which is the government introduced a scheme which was ultimately called everyone in which was an attempt within six weeks to get everybody who was sleeping rough off the streets and into accommodation and it was by and large done albeit in a way which the government didn't necessarily anticipate because local authorities took it seriously they did actually provide accommodation to a lot of rough sleepers very very quickly and two things were apparent from that one it could be done first and foremost. So this isn't a problem so difficult, so complicated, so polycentric that we just can't solve this. And, it, and it's naive to say that we can. Yes, we can do it. There's a political will to do it. And the second thing was the rationale for it was different. It wasn't any longer about sentiment. It wasn't about being sentimental. It wasn't about it being a moral outrage. It was for public health reasons, because it, it was a recognition that we were all collectively better off if we didn't have people rough sleeping. 
But it does seem to me that somewhere in that mode of thinking might be some of the answers to this problem. Stop making it about the individuals. Stop making it about whether or not they're the deserving or the undeserving more. Stop making it about you or I, you know, and, and virtue signaling. And do we care enough about homeless people to be good people? Neither of those are ever going to solve the problem. We need to look at it structurally, and therefore, in order to look at it structurally, I think we need to recognise it's a collective problem that we all share, and the solution to it is ultimately likely to be political. And uh, I've said nothing about how human rights plays any role in that, but perhaps <laughs> that can come up in the discussion after. But in my view, it does play a role, uh, and the other speakers will, 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 will no doubt address that in some more detail. Perhaps I'll have Jamie, to if we can questions. leave it there, please. Time has caught up with us slightly. Thanks. But thank you very much indeed. Now, if I can hand the floor to Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, the issue that I'm addressing is essentially uh, the role that government policy plays in uh, addressing homelessness and protecting human rights uh, of, of homeless individuals. And I don't think that you can avoid when looking at that issue, what has already happened and, and the extent to which we can see that governmental policy actually is the overarching driver of the particular approach to homelessness in any given case. And that it seems to me, and, and this is sort of the, the conclusion aspect of, of what I'm about to say, that if we are to see tangible results in terms of uh, getting people into uh, suitable, appropriate accommodation for them, that it is going to have to be driven not only uh, by the charities and the organisations, but by the government itself. Uh, and in so doing, they are going to have to have the buy-in of the local authorities that are actually implementing uh, these policies on the ground. Um, there seems to me to be a discord, essentially, between what uh, the government wishes to achieve and what local authorities, who are ultimately the uh, uh, the uh, uh, providers in, in this context are able to achieve with the resources that they have available to them. And, and I fully agree with Lord Berg that this uh, resolving this issue is going to require people to think outside of the box, because what I'm about to explain to you in terms of the history uh, of government policy demonstrates that there is uh, a, a political agenda that is served depending on which uh, which party uh, is in political control uh, and what their specific agenda is, but also uh, it is uh, driven uh, in, in large part by the mood of the country. Uh, and I think a very good example of that, uh, James already referred to, that when we had the pandemic, there was very little said about the Everyone in Initiative. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that that was a demonstration of the the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of having a will to provide these uh, uh and to an extent what we've seen historically um, has been short of having a true will to get uh, homelessness resolved as an issue. So, I mean, the, really the, the starting point uh, was the National Assistance Act in 1948. And what one saw there was essentially a, a, a knee-jerk uh, reactionary approach to emergency instances of homelessness. And, and it was never satisfactory. Um, uh, and insofar as uh, its administration was concerned, we were, we were looking at a very disparate uh, focus with social services provision, looking to sidestep um, the cost of dealing with homeless persons. And you saw an awful lot of uh, shifting of homeless persons from uh, authority to authority uh, because ultimately if you could place them outside of your area then you were no longer ultimately responsible for them. Well, uh, in 1977 with the introduction of the Housing and Homeless Persons Act 1977 a, a shift uh, towards recognizing that homelessness was something that needed to be dealt with more on a district uh, and, and uh, local authority level. And you saw various changes brought in uh, that were designed to statutorily codify uh, a desire to assist the homelessness, the, the homeless. Uh, and that was to be administered by 
district councils and, and London borough um, councils at that time. The other key issue that arose in 1977, and one that I think that we need to have regard to in terms of human rights implications, um, is that local authorities, through the introduction of the local connection rules, rather than local connection being a, a, an ability to transfer people from an authority to an authority, in fact, it was designed to stop people from shifting the burden around and to actually take responsibility for those persons that were within their local authority area. Uh, and in the light of what Jamie briefly referred to, these out of area placements where people are being sent, you know, 200 miles, uh, normally up north. Uh, and I say that as a resident of Leicestershire, Leicestershire, where we see a lot of that sort of out of area placement taking place, particularly with people from London. Um, it, it, it is, again, a desire to sort of shift the problem away from the more desirable areas and away from where local authorities consider that greater expense is being incurred through uh, the, the localised problem. Um, and moving on then from the 77 Act, um, you had considerable local government and government policy dealing with the issue of asylum seekers, for example. Uh, uh, initially, asylum seekers were treated uh, in precisely the same way as everybody else that were eligible for assistance under uh, the 77 Act. Uh, but what one saw in the 90s was a, a political agenda designed, uh, I hope I don't speak too strongly when I say, to almost demonise the asylum seeker uh, and to uh, essentially deprive them, not of any homelessness assistance, but rather of the settled accommodation that arguably persons fleeing from war-torn countries require more than anyone. <laughs> that, that ability to have somewhere that they can stay for uh, a settled period of time in order to rebuild their lives. Uh, and so what we saw during the 90s was a slow encroachment culminating in the Housing Act of 1996 with actually rendered asylum seekers ineligible for assistance under the homelessness provisions. Uh, and so, in, in context, the rights of the individual, when one looks at the development of, of homelessness law historically, um, have essentially been a political pawn. Uh, and it is with some hope that people looked at the introduction of the Homelessness Reduction Act 2017, which is actually a private member's bill introduced by Bob Blackman. I think he came second in the in the polling for it. And so Stephanie, apologies for interrupting. We, yeah. we are, yes, we are slightly over time. Okay, no worries. Uh, I, will, I will wrap that up. If anyone's got any questions that follow on from that, then I'm happy to answer those. Thank you very much. Indeed. No problem. Thank you. Apologies to Jamie and to Dr. Coldo. Kessler, I wasn't looking at my script properly. I introduced in the wrong order. Um, I realize that now. And no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Dr. Calder Kessler, if I can hand the floor to you. Okay, thanks very much. I'll be thank brief, you. although that's the worst thing you can say because it's an indication that you're not going to be brief, but I will try. It's a uh, thanks very much for the invitation, first of all. Um, thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's a uh, an honor for me to share the panel with Stephanie and Jamie and to follow the remarks of Lord Bird. Um, Lord Bird began, um, or didn't begin, but at some point, at the beginning, at some point in the talk, said, uh, Can we say to the government that it is a matter of human rights to take people out from the streets? And when I heard that, I, I thought, Well, the right to adequate housing can help you actually uh, make that sort of argument. Uh, the rights to Adequate housing is recognised in international human rights treaties. By the way, that's the angle I'm being asked to provide an international human rights law perspective. So it is recognised in a number of international human rights treaties that the United Kingdom and indeed 170 other countries around the world have voluntarily uh, signed up to as a matter of national sovereignty. It hasn't been imposed on any of the 171 countries. All of them voluntarily in exercise of sovereignty have made that decision. So it can help you. However, Jamie said several times, and, and also Stephanie, this is a complex issue. This is a structural problem. And I think all of us lawyers, and let alone human rights lawyers, need to be, I think, epistemically humble about how much a human rights or a legal perspective can 
uh, provides to address homelessness. I believe we may have some answers, but we certainly don't have all the answers. We may not even have the answers to the most important questions, but I think human rights approach to housing and to homelessness may have something to offer. So I will focus on that in the next three or four minutes, but I don't want to give the indication that I believe that a human rights perspective is a panacea that is going to solve uh, all problems. So as, as uh, I said, the right to adequate housing is recognized in a number of international human rights treaties uh, developed over the last 30 years by a number of uh, not only scholars, but also courts around the world, uh, international uh, bodies, uh, international practitioners. So I think we have now a much more sophisticated understanding of what the right to adequate housing may mean, thanks to the participation of many, many actors. Um, a good reference about what adequate in adequate housing means can be general comment number four uh, is uh, from 1993. It's a document from the United Nations that explains that if you go if you want to assess whether the policies in relation to adequate housing in a country are compliant with the international standards, you can look at this document and it will give you an indication about affordability of housing in the private sector, about accessibility in the public sector. Uh, about cultural adequacy, for example, we were talking about uh, asylum seekers and refugees, uh, about physical accessibility as well for people with some sort of disabilities. But they, they are some, there are some useful tools uh, out there. Uh, according to some um, uh, rigorous scholarly work, 42% of national constitutions recognize the right to, to adequate housing, and the number is going up. Uh, it's not the case of the UK, because first of all, we don't have a written constitution here, but the quasi-constitutional Bill of Rights, the Human Rights Act, does not include the right to adequate housing either. So the UK is, is one of those countries that does not have the right to adequate housing as such in legislation. In my opinion, it would be wrong to conclude from this that this means that the UK is systematically violating the right to adequate housing. The right to the UK. Uh, local authorities and national governments for decades have been doing a lot of things that are probably uh, uh, better than the policies implemented by many countries that have included uh, housing in the constitution. So I don't want to, again, going back to the earlier point, simply saying that something is a human rights doesn't mean that magically that country is uh, a paradise and, and, and the UK is not. But I think the UK with its current you know, legal tradition and with certain, a lot of political uh, commitments could build on the principle of the right to house in and do something better. Is not recognized in UK, in, 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 in UK wide uh, legislation, but there are interesting initiatives going on in Scotland and in Wales. And I think it's interesting for those of us living in England to pay attention to these um, initiatives because there's a lot we can learn from them. And I will finish with this, my first uh, remarks. Uh, uh, Scotland is incorporating or is discussing how to incorporate all human rights into Scots law, including social economic rights, like the right to housing. And Wales is also considering uh, recognizing specifically the right to other good housing. So if they do that in a year or two from now, both nations recognize the right to housing. Those of us living in England should say, why not us? Why are we less protected? Why are people in this country, in this nation of England, protected less than people in Wales and Scotland? And I think we need to pay attention and, and learn, the, learn the best lessons from it. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, for Dr. Kessler. Um, now, just looking at the time, you see, it's just, it's 5.19. I'm mindful of the fact that Lord Bird would like to leave by 5.30. So, yes. I'm leaving. Oh, I have to tell you, I've never been to a meeting at his house. I, I'm sorry, most of the people I deal with around housing are people who are there because, you know, they're running organisations, supply line and all that stuff. But it's so good to get the legal perspective. And I want to thank Iris for talking to me on the train <laughs> because I think we've got to find a way of working together. I think you talked to me first. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, thank you very much for your kind words, Lord Bird, and thank you for kindly agreeing to stay till six o'clock. On that basis, then, then perhaps what I'll do is I'll proceed with the agendas we have it and then return to you in, in a short while, if I may.
Thank you. Okay. Um, just turning to the panelists for a second, I have some questions on policy and the law, if I may. Um, Jamie, the first question goes to you, and that is, from your experience, is the access to adequate housing considered a human right in the UK? That's the first part of the question. Uh, a second part of the question is, what legal protections exist to safeguard the rights to adequate housing, and how can these be strengthened? And then the final part is, are there landmark legal cases or precedents? Uh, uh, first answer is no. Uh, the right to housing is not recognised in English law. Uh, we have signed up to it as a country, which uh, Dr. Kassler referred to, um, but that has no direct effect in our in our legal system. So you can't go to, to court and say, uh, that is something that Just Fair, the organisation that was mentioned a while ago that both Calder and I have had um, involvement in, has been working to address and try to generate some constitutional change so we would have that right. But at the moment, we don't have it. Re dealing very quickly with your middle question, which is, well, what legal protections do exist? You know, we do have some quite good legal um, safeguards in the sense that we do have duties on local authorities to provide accommodation to certain homeless people in certain circumstances and in a limited way, but it's full of problems. But the overarching problem is really the one that Stephanie spoke about, and she can perhaps develop this, is it's the tension between what in fact is required to be done vis-a-vis -vis what is possible in the society that we live in. And there you see the interaction between broader government policy, some of the negative effects of capitalism, frankly, and then an absence of, of, of straightforward political will. But I could give you 15 changes we could make today that would improve the situation, but I don't have that time, obviously. And then the final question, are there landmark legal cases or precedents? Yes, of course, because you have to develop um, the case law around the statutory provisions and see what they exactly mean. In fact, it's a very litigious area of, of work because so many local authorities try to make restrictive decisions which are restrictive of the statutory rights. And of course, people who represent the people who would be accommodated to try and to look for expansive interpretations of these rights so it, it's very very litigious final quick remark on that is if we had an enforceable right to adequate housing what kind of change would that make is a really interesting question whether if we've had a broad right that's characterized in that way would that make a meaningful impact i think it absolutely would i've been inclined to agree with coldo that it wouldn't necessarily be a panacea but I think some of those 15 changes I've spoken about a moment ago would have been potentially either never been made in the first place or would they, they would be reversed by virtue of judicial intervention, which says this particular failing is incompatible with the, adequate, the, the right to adequate housing if we were to have such a right on the statute book that we could enforce. Um, so I hope that's answered your question. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie. Um, Stephanie, we have about 30 seconds. Do you want to add something to it or shall I move on to the next question? Um, I think uh, the the overarching um, strengthening that I envisage a system that's like the one that Finland has, where we are not assessing entitlement to homelessness assistance based on the um, I think that, that we need to have uh, uh, right not necessarily to housing per se but to solving homelessness whether that be through drug intervention whether it's alcohol anonymous you know but be having a bigger toolkit from which to uh, uh to provide help so i think that kind of goes back to what lord bird said earlier on in relation to obviously finding a mechanism to deal with these kind of very critical and central issues. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a second question, and this is for you, Stephanie, if I may. Um, what role does government policy play in addressing homelessness and protecting the human rights of homeless individuals? That's the first part of the question. The second part is, are there specific policies or initiatives that have been successful in addressing homelessness and upholding human rights both from government as well as local government perspective. 
So I think in answer to the first aspect of the question, which is uh, what role does government policy play in addressing homelessness and protecting human rights of homeless individuals, um, a fundamental one, uh, because ultimately uh, the homelessness protection within the uh, uh, England and Wales is a statutorily enshrined uh, entitlement because we don't have a written constitution, we don't have a right to adequate housing. What we have is a, a, a scheme by which people qualify for different levels of assistance with, with their homelessness. Um, and uh, the, the extent of that role is broadly contingent upon what the objectives of that particular government in power uh, are. And so we've seen uh, the Homelessness uh, Reduction Act uh, 2017 uh, come in, which has placed far greater emphasis on prevention uh, of homelessness. Uh, and uh, one may uh, take the view that spending money on litigation after the event is better spent on the prevention uh, aspect of the of the 2017 Act. It was not surprising that that came in as a private member's bill, be it it did have cross-party support. Uh, it was surprising that that hadn't been grasped up by the, the government in question. Um, as for the second aspect, are there specific policies or initiatives? I mean, Jamie has already referred to the Everyone In initiative, which was an example of what can be done if the political will is there. Um, and from a local government perspective, we see a lot of housing strategies as I say, that look at uh, the provision of more affordable accommodation in, throughout of area placements. That is not necessarily to the advantage of an, a particular individual's human rights, but I do think it illustrates that there is a use, a better use to which we can put void properties and um, uh, sort of derelict land and so on through our planning systems in order to free that up, in order to address the issue of homelessness. So just following on from that, so basically we're trying to, in terms of obviously shortage of housing stock, by mm. dealing with it in that way, we can kind of try to remedy the issue of uh, shortage of housing stock. Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I have a third question, obviously mindful of time as well. Um, this is for you, Coldo. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, how does international human rights law address the right to adequate housing? This is the first part. Second part is, how are these implemented domestically in the UK? And then the third part, if you will, are there any examples of successful strategies or best practices on a state level? I will use my time in the last part, if that's okay, because the first the first part was sure. a little bit what I tried to cover in the first I will focus on the on the final one. Sorry, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Sharing the microphone, I keep forgetting. My apologies. That's, that's quite all right. I will focus on the final one. Uh, Lord Bird began the, in, in his remarks. The first sentence was, "Human rights and homelessness are never put together in this country," and I I think that's broadly speaking true. Although I think it has been changing in the last five years in particular. Um, and I think actually the big issue had a significant role in changing it because when Philip Alston, the UN, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights visited the UK in an official mission in November 2018, the big issue had an important role uh, providing some light over the, over the, the visit. Uh, I don't think the visit as such led to any particular policy change. So there were, you know, in the end, he produced a report with some you know, 35 pages or so with a, a list of recommendations. I don't think <laughs> any of those recommendations has been implemented, not a list as far as I know. But I think that mission helps to demystify a lot about what human rights are about. In this country, in England in particular, there is a widespread, a widespread perception that human rights is some sort of somehow alien, um, foreign, legalistic, jargonistic, only helpful for prisoners or terrorists or uh, undesirable people. And, uh, or even worse than all this is a European construct. Um, and I think that mission contributed to demystify it, to make 
human rights and international accountability mechanisms more relatable and understandable by many community groups. I know because at the time I used to work for Just Fair, we organized a number of events uh, with uh, Philip Olson himself. Uh, the University of Essex also did the same in, uh, in Jaywick. Uh, I organized some events in Newcastle and I could see that the way in which he um, listened to people and made human rights international law uh, relatable to them in a way that was not patronizing and in a way that made the standards understandable um, contributed to change a little bit the, the the analysis and the understanding of human rights. Since then, there have been a lot of community level organizations that initially formed the Social Rights Alliance of the Northeast and then the Social Rights Alliance of England, and now many groups that are actually not the usual suspects in the human rights community who are using human rights in their advocacy and in their and in their debates. There is more and more debate at the civil society level on human rights. Certainly the most that I've seen since I began working on this in, in this country in the last 10 years ago or so. So I think things have changed. Um, now, whether this means that in a year or two from now, we're gonna have an ESCR, an economic and social rights bill in parliament, I very much doubt so. But I think at the level of uh, policy discussion, a lot has happened. And we see what's going on in Wales and in Scotland. And again, I encourage you all to follow closely, uh, particularly you live in England and you are envious of them. Uh, about what it means, about what it means at, a, at, an, at a national level um, and, and the international mechanisms, there are loads, including Mr. Prachagopal, the, the, the Special Rapporteur on Housing, and the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and the European Committee of Social Rights that provide international accountability. Uh, I'm the director of the Human Rights Clinic at Essex, and we have a project with The Shift, which is an NGO set up by Leilani Faha, uh, uh, Mr. Rajagopal's predecessor. Uh, and we are looking at how international standards on housing can be used to assess domestic policies uh, in practice. Um, but, I, but going back to the initial question, are human rights and homelessness uh, disconnected? Well, I think by and large, yes. I think at the discourse level, yes. But I think it has changed a lot in the last five years. And we can learn from other countries, but we can also see how a lot of uh, um, homelessness charities, large human rights NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, and even Liberty, but also, most importantly, community-level organizations are increasingly using human rights and making human rights locally relevant. So there is, I think there is room for, for hope and for optimism about that. Yes, uh, Dr. Kasler. Um, when I was talking about human rights, I was talking about the rather strange uh, dis distortion of it, which is the fact that most people think that people should have a right to sleep on the streets. And I think that that was hiding the fact that our responsibility should extend to the poorest and the weakest and the most broken even if they, as your uh, as the colleague said, uh, the question, even to those people who say, you know, I want to sleep on the streets. I know hundreds of people who, over the years. So what I'm talking about is extending the hand of society, not allowing people to die on our streets that way. And, and that is where you run into the problem of human rights because people say people should be allowed to do what they want. They should be. We allow. I mean, everyone on the panel can get drunk tonight, and then go home and and buy a load of cocaine and and all that. So why shouldn't we extend that right to the poorest among us right. to harm themselves? So these are all the arguments that are going round, and I'm I'm very concerned because I want to I I want to put my arm around. I want society to put their arm around the people who are the most needy because. They're the ones who are dying before the rest of us, you know. So that's what I'm really... And, yeah. and, may I, yes, uh, yes. And, and for me, an important part of the construct is the idea of what they want and choice. You said initially, when, when you were prompted by the question about, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of homeless people choose to live yeah. in the streets, and, and, and you explained, well, I mean, that choice is limited, isn't it? They, and it, it very much is limited. And I think that is uniquely the added value of human rights. The added value of human rights is not about creating legal structures. It's not about 
going to court. It's not about giving more power to judges. It's about be giving more choice to people. And uh, you know, I think there's a uh, there's a statement. I think it was Anatole France who said that uh, the law, in in all its majesty, gives prohibits both the rich and the poor to sleep under a bridge. So, yeah, but only to one of these two. Uh, that statement is meaningful, isn't it? Uh, uh, I, 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 we don't need the law for that, but a law that is inspired by social rights gives choice to people, and and uh, that's ultimately uh, ultimately the the situation. Poverty. I, what I hear from community groups with lived experience of poverty is that poverty entraps people. It's not only about resources and how much you can spend. It's about how limited choices you really have, and therefore you choose between A or B, but both A and B are awful. And, and social rights, taking social rights seriously is about increasing the choices for people. So it's not only A or B, but actually you choose among more decent, more decent op options. Yeah, Steve, yeah. I mean, I think, sorry, can I just come in yes. on that? I mean, I think one of the reasons we've ended up with this slightly skewed debate about this topic because is because attempts were made to further criminalize rough sleeping and begging and the Human Rights Act gives you some form of ostensible defence against overweening executive action or parliamentary action, some protection against the rules of the majority. But because our Human Rights Act doesn't include the social rights in it, it only includes the civil and political rights, the only right that was available to those people who were trying to protect those people from the criminalisation that the government was otherwise intent on introducing was to use the right to freedom of expression, which is contained in our Human Rights Act, to say, well, they've got the right to express themselves in that way, and you can't take that away in a blanket way. It's a pretty weak argument, I, I agree, and it's got a slight perverse element to it. But the reason that was being done was because there weren't the other legal avenues available to tackle the policy that was otherwise going to be introduced. If we had social rights, you know, the argument might have been a very different one. It might not have been about freedom of expression and the right to be on the streets. It might have been right. You can't criminalise people if you failed in your primary duty to ensure adequate housing is available to them in the first place. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 the unbalanced nature of our human rights protections has actually forced a rather perverse outcome, which has led a very prominent activist in this area to be doubtful about how useful human rights can be, which is a sad indictment of the whole process. Whereas if we had all of these rights available to us, we might not be having that particular conversation. Um, so yeah, it's, that's why it occurred to me to say that. Just following on from what you just said, Jamie, so you saying that basically as far as the issue is concerned, it's a social issue. So in other, in other words, it's being passed on. So criminalizing it is not necessarily the answer. It's definitely not the answer. But how do people who are active in this space try to prevent it from becoming the de facto answer by virtue of a government saying, this is how we're going to solve it. It's all about personal choice and their own failings as individuals. We'll send them to prison for it. And that will stop them doing it. I mean, it's idiotic. You only need to say it out loud to realize how idiotic it is. <laughs> But, you know, there wasn't a way in which you could challenge that under our domestic legal structure. If they want to do it, we can't stop them. The only thing we've got is the Human Rights Act, which gives us some power to fight back. But unfortunately, our Human Rights Act is deficient in the sense it doesn't protect social rights. It only protects civil and political rights. As, as wonderful and important as that is, we mustn't lose sight of that. It's, an, it's not sufficient to ensure we get the kind of social change through the law that we were all discussing and would like to see. Well, as you probably know, and maybe some of the members of the audience know, um, in relation to prisons, we had issues with prisons being overcrowded at some point. So sending people who are obviously involved in offences or matters relating to homelessness, you're dealing with very, very trivial matters in comparison to obviously the more serious criminal offences. And obviously prisons are in place for those and, and reserved for those in essence. Um, so yes, thank you for that, Jamie. Um, obviously again, just mindful of time. Uh, we. The audience will have an opportunity to ask questions later on if you wish to. But um, well, why don't we I... see if they want to ask any questions now? Because we've all been talking for a long time. Uh, well, uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, really. Even though we have a lot to say. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, yeah. I, I, well, um, we can. We can if you want. Yes. We have I, I do know minutes. that we, we have maybe five minutes because we have to introduce the UN Special Rapporteur and obviously get him to come and give his presentation. But uh, um, Iris, please, if you. Hello, uh, I'm Sarthak from the Commonwealth Secretariat, but here I'm in my personal capacity 
Uh, so my question is, in the SDGs as well as the work of the World Banks, it's always the discussion is always about poverty alleviation and not at all, uh, you know, complete elimination of poverty, unlike we have seen that of apartheid or slavery or those things. Now with the 2030 SDGs uh, and the summit coming up and the global summit for the future that's being planned by the UN Secretary General next year, how much should there be a push uh, or do you expect multilateral organizations uh, towards pushing for elimination of uh, poverty as the language to go forward with, rather than alleviation of poverty, which is the lingo that, which is the status quo currently. Would that impact uh, in terms of the work that's being undertaken by the organizations or entities like the World Bank? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, at the same time, and then you can. Yes, yes, we've only got a few minutes, and then we'll have a list of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a lawyer, I don't, obviously I don't look like a lawyer, but hello. Um, so I'm not going to ask a very legal question, but um, I was wondering, we talked a lot about, you know, how human rights are often used as a defense of you know, sleeping on the streets and uh, the, the, their freedom of expression. But I think that in public debate, about homelessness and about housing supply, especially, because um, we talked about not necessarily compulsory purchase, but but using void properties. It's oftentimes the rights of the, the property rights of, of certain landlords, which are used to, you know, tackle any call for uh, any further homelessness provision. Uh, and if local authorities don't have the money to build housing because they're giving it all to private landlords, how do we kind of tackle or, or how should we think about how property rights and the property rights of, of landlords or, or large landlords interact with this any potential right to 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 not live on the street you know okay okay thank you for that question as well um do we have any other questions might as well deal with all of them at the same time <laughs> yes we have a third question iris this lady here Hiya. Um, I work with Lord Bird at The Big Issue and my job is about mobilising the public um, to campaign against poverty. So my question is, we've talked a lot about political will um, and I wonder if you have any advice about how we can make the idea of housing as a human right more attractive to a government that's not necessarily that receptive to the idea um, of increasing people's rights, especially if you look at their record over the last few years current government is about to be put out of office and <laughs> well we've seen you know we've got I'm some kidding, time I'm to kidding, keep kidding, I'm kidding. i didn't say that out loud and don't quote me on it but. okay <laughs> thank you all right who would like to deal with the first question please i i, I can do the first question please but do. i also want to deal with the third one but <laughs> we'll do, we'll do that, that, that's that's fine um the sdgs the 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 um the SDGs were an, an expression of failure, really, because the SDGs followed the MDGs. In the year 2000, the UN General Assembly adopted the Millennium Development Goals, and they said in 50 years, in 15 years from now, we will achieve certain things. And then that milestone was closely approaching, and they faced two choices. Do we admit failure, or do we come up with a new thing to replace the old thing? And obviously, they could not admit failure. So they came up with a new thing called the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a cynical response that we are approaching 2030, and the world will need to decide what to do <laughs> in 2030. It's a cynical response, but I have to admit, the SDGs had certain improvements over the FDG, over the MDGs. Two of them were, first, in my view, that they were more closely aligned with human rights standards. It's a collection of 169 or so indicators, and they were more recognizable from a human rights perspective. And the second one, more important in my opinion, is that the SDGs apply to all countries. So it was based on the idea that all countries can do better, all countries face difficulties. And even though some countries are, if you compare them somewhat with than others, but all countries can do better. And I think this takes us to the question of assessing what countries can do within their own, considering their own resources. And human rights approach to social justice gives you this tool because what we are we are not comparing countries like for like. We are assessing what countries can do considering the maximum of the available resources. So we need to assess what's the UK, which is the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world, what they can do 
in relation to housing or in relation to poverty. And I think that is, and also the SDGs without, while not using the same language, go in the same direction. And we need to track progress of the UK, not comparing with other countries, but rather comparing with what the, where the country should be. And I, I would like to see that approach in 2030, looking at each country's its own performance in light of the maximum of available resources. Um, Second second. Second. Right, to property one. I'm going to look at the fact the government can find money when it needs to. Yeah, that's <laughs> a very important point. I mean, uh, you, you, you might not be a lawyer, but it's an absolutely on point question, you know, and uh, you're behind all of this is, is the tension that exists between those who have and those who have not. I mean, fairly fundamentally. It's very hard to answer that swiftly. But what I would say um, is in the broad sense, human rights, act, human rights might not be a panacea, but if we had enforceable economic and social rights, it would be a genuine power shift in this country. It would actually represent a shift of power from those who don't have, from those who have too much to those who don't have enough in a, in a literal sense, because you would be able to enforce these rights um, in a tangible, substantive way that resulted in outcomes, or otherwise they'd be completely meaningless, which you know, arguably they currently are because we can't enforce them. Actually, the biggest uh, impact that enforceable rights would be likely to make wouldn't be in the courtroom. It would be on policymakers across the country who would recognise that they had these uh, obligations that they had to fulfil, and that would require changes in approach. And of course, there is no absolute right to property. We all know that. It's always qualified to some degree, whether it's in the form of taxation or whether it's in the form of limits on use. And you would have to see changes in the approach taken. But by God, we need them. And without those changes, it's very difficult to see how we'd ever make the, the bigger change, which is seeing less people on the streets. My final quick point about that is huge amounts of money have gone into the hands of private landlords over the last 20 years when we restricted social housing, we made up for that deficiency by allowing people to, to claim housing benefit, albeit at substandard rates, all of which goes into private landlords, a lot of which over time went into investment properties, of which you know, there are multiple different uh, beneficiaries, including many MPs. Work. But there's a huge transfer of public wealth to private wealth. And if we'd use a lot of that public wealth to, to build sustainable housing where we didn't need to, fall upon the private rent sector to accommodate homeless people, we might be in a very different situation today. And one of the great things about some of the evidence in relation to human rights is actually over time, they tend to favour more cost-effective long-term solutions rather than short-term expensive solutions to problems. And, and, and COVID and everyone in was a good example of that because that was actually done at great cost by opening up private hotels and things like that and mandating them to provide accommodation to homeless people, which obviously had to be paid for, but it was you know, you're paying at that stage through the nose because you're trying to fix a problem you should have fixed long ago by structural reform. And human rights can help with some of that. <coughs> Where do we get the money from? <laughs> <laughs> the money tree. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the point that I wanted to make in response to your question uh, was we can see that where the political will is strong, and public opinion is behind that political will, you can find the money. And the example that I'll give you in the housing context is the fact that uh, millions and millions of pounds have been made available uh, for the purpose of local authorities building or compulsorily purchasing accommodation in which to place Ukrainian and Afghan uh, refugees. And it, it seems to me uh, that part of the issue that we have to address with tackling homelessness is really a PR uh, endeavour. It is about demonstrating to the Sun readers that you will be better off, this country will be better off, if we aren't spending money on this and we start spending money on that. And I think this goes back to the link between adequate, suitable housing and poverty. And the reality is, is that we are seeing an increase in poverty and increases in homelessness. 
And this is a case of correlation of causation rather than correlation. If you uh, going back to the housing first point, if you can find the political will to provide stable housing for people, then you can use your resources in order to um, support that person then in terms of their productivity uh, and their ability to pay tax. And that's how you balance the books ultimately, it seems to me. But, but, but that needs to be broken down and modeled in such a way that it is palatable to the man on the Clapham omnibus, to coin Lord Denning's phrase. Why well, we need a Ministry of Poverty, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, after the 1965 Rent Act, which was Harold Wilson's, what actually happened was uh, the power of the relationship between tenant and and landlord was shifted to the tenant. And what that led to, I mean, I was there because I was there taking the piss, so to speak, <laughs> uh, and not paying my rent for more than a year and then leaving. What it led to was a 40% shrink in private rented accommodation. Uh, and this led to an enormous pressure on social housing, on local authority housing. No housing associations at the time, of course. And this led to an enormous thing. So what happened was the council had to keep raising the bar. My, my two brothers were living in Fulham and they were like 80 in the list and 100. And, you know, the, the with the fact that there was more need for social housing, they went up to a thousand and all sorts of stuff like that. And what happened was they created a ghettoization unintentionally. So what happened was you had to be really desperate to get social housing because there were so few houses. So it meant that there was these big housing estates, sink estates, they come into being in that particular period because the government had not taken into account the fact that if you completely change over from one process where the landlord has all the power to no power or very little power, uh, then what it would lead to is it would lead to a shrinking. And this is when the middle classes started to move in and buy the properties. And this is when you get the gentrification of cities and all that. Now, the only answer to me, for me, is if we make social housing open to virtually everybody, so that what you do is you take people in for a particular period of time when they're being a doctor or training to be a doctor or a police officer or all that, and you broaden it and you make it sociable housing, then you, you depollute it of the problems of social ghettoization. And that to me is the only way you can do it, but it would involve an massive investment. And I think it's the kind of investment that we should be leaning on the, the next government. Hopefully it is these, you know, the geezers, uh, who had their party last week, and I was out in Liverpool. Uh, but the point is, and, and we have to re-engage re with social housing. Only 2% of people whose children come from social housing ever finish their high school certificates or get a highly skilled job or get to the university. So, so what you've got is people who are stuck in in unskilled jobs, semi-skilled jobs, long-term unemployment. And we have to break that thing. Social housing is the most precious thing and we need to be fighting for it again and broadening it out so it becomes more sociable. Thank you. And I would like to thank the panel. Thank you so much. Um, we will be able to discuss everything um, hopefully over drinks afterwards. But until then, I would like to give the floor to Balakrishnan uh, Rajagopal, who will be giving the closing address. Apologies for being late. And thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Bird. Thank you.
apologies, we cannot hear you. One second, sorry. You try seeking again for me. And try Of technology. You try once more, because I can see that you're speaking, but we can't hear you out. Yeah, the microphone's not working on your end, so I think the microphone's not connected. It's my, your mic's not moving on our end, so it looks like it might be a microphone issue on your end. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this important event. Most countries in the world, uh, I would say, are experiencing a situation of poly crisis, an intersection of multiple crises from military, political, economic, ecological, health, and social. Homelessness is a manifestation of these uh, poly crises, but remains a problem which is actually within the power of most wealthy countries to solve. While there is a lack of reliable worldwide statistics, homelessness is a global concern in all world regions. For those countries or organizations that have made efforts to track various forms of homelessness, the figures are alarming. For example, according to latest official figures of the US, over 500,000 people are considered homeless. And it should be noted that over 40% of them are people of African descent who make up only 12% of the population. In most EU countries, homelessness has significantly increased since 2010, at least by 70%. The eighth overview on housing exclusion in Europe published in September of 2023 estimates that at least 895,000 persons live in Europe, either in street situation, in emergency accommodation, or in accommodation for the homeless. In many developing countries, homelessness is either not surveyed or often the issue is named differently, but homelessness as a human rights violation is similarly persistent. The most common form is housing deprivation and exclusion, visible in the form of large, underserviced, poorly built informal settlements, often without access to safe water and sanitation and electricity, and in which residents live frequently in constant fear of forced evictions. However, other forms of homelessness exist as well in the global south, whether it is pavement dwellers, people occupying dangerous, often so-called unauthorized structures, or residing in IDP or refugee camps. Opening this session of Human Rights Council, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, stressed that ending homelessness and ensuring affordable housing for all are firmly embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals. It's also a human rights imperative. He said that states must recognize homelessness as a violation of human rights and dignity. I fully agree. The right to adequate housing has in fact been enshrined in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and other treaties since the 1960s, and is yet, yet denied to millions worldwide um, who lack access to any form of housing or even shelter and are forced to sleep rough or in structures unsuitable for a life in safety and security. Homelessness is not only a serious concern in terms of the right to adequate housing. If you look at morbidity and mortality rates of persons in situation of homelessness and compare those with people who are adequately housed, the differences are shocking. The median age of, of death for persons in street situation has in some industrialized countries 
been estimated to be 49 years, over 25 years lower than that is for the overall population. There is no doubt that homelessness violates also the right to the highest form of attainable health, right to water and sanitation, to privacy and the right to life, which is more than mere survival, but includes as well the notion of a life with dignity. Failure of public authorities to prevent and address homelessness is a state failure to uphold the most essential elements of the human right to adequate housing and other fundamental human rights that everyone should enjoy without discrimination. Unfortunately, too many countries fail to recognize or protect economic, social, and cultural rights, such as the right to adequate housing, whose denial is almost exclusively felt by the poorest and the most marginalized. Homelessness cannot be solved without recognizing and protecting the right to housing, in fact, if not in law as well. While the pathways into homelessness are manifold, it is possible to prevent, reduce, and end it, or at least reduce it to marginal numbers. This is particularly true for countries that have access to significant financial and other resources and have functioning public administrations. We saw how it could be done during the COVID-19 pandemic. Regrettably, those measures have all ended in most places and we are back to square one. For those 13 European countries where there are more reliable estimates, the persons in situation of homelessness in Europe are of course still too many, but not so many that this problem could not be dealt with. Those in situations of severe forms of homelessness represent only 0.174% of their total population. This surely is a solvable problem. For example, Finland has actually shown that reducing homelessness is possible by adopting a housing-led approach, providing affordable housing and, if necessary, uh, additional ambulance social support. In 1987, over 17,000 persons were counted in Finland as homeless. Latest official figures from 2022 indicate 3,686 persons in various forms of homelessness, a reduction by 83%. I'm encouraged by the fact that more and more countries have adopted national action plans to prevent and end homelessness or have started to undertake official data collection. Four African countries initiated at the UN General Assembly Resolution 76-133 on affordable housing to end homelessness that was adopted in 2021. And the UN Secretary General has just published a comprehensive report arguing strongly for a human rights-based approach to prevent and end homelessness. Portugal spearheaded during its EU presidency in 2021, the establishment of the European Platform on Combating Homelessness, in which all EU states agreed to work towards ensuring that by 2030, no one sees rough or lack of accessible, safe and appropriate emergency accommodation, that eviction should be prevented wherever possible and no one is evicted without assistance or an appropriate housing solution when needed. Dear colleagues and friends, with these introductory remarks, let me turn my attention, your attention to the particular focus of a project that I have embarked on together with the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Olivia Discuter, to end criminalization of homelessness. Regrettably, the use of criminal and administrative law to punish the poor, the homeless, the persons with mental disabilities, and other persons considered to be different, unpleasant, or deviating in their behavior from the majority has a long and outrageous tradition. Colonialism helped to export vagrancy laws globally, such as the British Vagrancy Act of 1824. Many European countries introduced similar vagrancy laws, which provided the legal basis to imprison so-called idle and disorderly persons, rogues and vagabonds, or incorrigible rogues, and subject them to forced labor, or intern them in so-called workhouses. Regrettably, the development of international human rights law in reaction to the international outcry against Nazi atrocities did not immediately result in the discrediting of vagrancy or other laws criminalizing persons experiencing homelessness or poverty. The first international human rights treaty that came into force after World War II, the European Convention on Human Rights, includes, for example, in its Article 5.1e, the, on the right to liberty and security of person, a provision allowing for the lawful detention of, quote, persons of unsound mind, alcoholics, or drug addicts, or vagrants, unquote. In 1971, the European Court of Human Rights ruled in the so-called vagrancy cases that the detention of the applicants in vagrancy centers in Belgium, where they were made to work in exchange for payment at a low rate, was neither a violation of the right to liberty and security of person, nor of Article 4 of the same convention prohibiting slavery and forced labor. In the U.S., it was only in the early 70s that a succession of vagrancy laws was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, although life-sustaining activities like sleeping or cooking continued to be criminalized by local jurisdictions or state laws. Germany's constitutional court ruled only in 1970 that begging and vagrancy should not be criminalized. Finland's 1883 vagrancy law was only repealed in 1987. Belgium abolishes laws against vagrancy and begging in 1983. 
In Greece, a provision in the Penal Code on Vagrancy was repealed in 1994, where begging was decriminalized only in 2018. In Argentina, a police edict on vagrancy and begging was declared unconstitutional in 1995. Mexico has informed me that there are still laws and regulations in force prohibiting begging, eating, sleeping, or performing personal hygienic activities in all or certain public places, while indicating to me that they are allegedly not enforced anymore. As you well know, there have been several attempts to repeal the Vagrancy Act in England, Wales, and Scotland that have served as a blueprint in so many countries, especially in the formerly colonized world. While well, Scotland managed to repeal this law in 1982, in 2022, this infamous act was formally scrapped in England and Wales as well, although the repeal lacks an implementation date, and there are many concerns that some form of criminalization of vagrancy or associated behaviors will continue. Indeed, this archaic law is still being used to arrest many people. More than 3,800 homeless people have been arrested in England and Wales since 2018. More than 1,000 homeless people have been arrested for sleeping rough or begging since the UK government pledged to scrap the act. While I welcome the formal repeal of this law, I must note with concern the reports that the repeal has not been implemented and so many are still being arrested under it. I have communicated my concerns to the government of the UK along with many other special procedure mandate orders. The scrapping of vagrancy acts, the amendment of penal codes, and judgments of the constitutional courts regrettably do not mean an end to the criminalization of homelessness or sanctions and punishments for performing life-sustaining activities in public through local bylaws. In fact, in countries such as Switzerland, several cantons reintroduced or expanded laws prohibiting begging. Hungary reintroduced a criminalization of persons experiencing homelessness in 2018. In the US, many cities have made efforts to circumvent judgments aimed at decriminalizing homelessness by adopting regulations that are considered to meet the requirements of US constitutional law. As we speak, many Western states and cities are engaged in a constitutional tussle before the U.S. Supreme Court, challenging a Ninth Circuit ruling which had held criminalization of life-sustaining activities of homeless persons to be a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment. As far as Africa is concerned, the campaign to decriminalize poverty and status made a comprehensive submission to me covering 19 African countries, indicating that in most of these countries, vagrancy laws dating back from the colonial period are still in force. In South Asia, anti-vagrancy and anti-beggary statutes were adopted during the colonial period and are systematically used to hound and harass the poor who lack adequate housing and income. All of them are fundamentally inconsistent with modern human rights norms, including the constitutional jurisprudence of their own courts. At the UN, the guiding principles on extreme poverty in human rights, which are adopted by the Human Rights Council in 2012, as well as the guidelines for the implementation of right to adequate housing developed by my predecessor, recommend that states should prohibit and address discrimination on the ground of homelessness or other housing stat status and repeal all laws and measures that criminalize or penalize homeless people or behavior associated with being homeless, such as sleeping or eating in public spaces. In Ju June 2020, the Human Rights Council called in Resolution 43-14 on states to take all measures necessary to eliminate legislation that criminalize homelessness. While the UN General Assembly passed last year for the first time a resolution on homelessness, calling homelessness an affront to human dignity, the resolution itself has regrettably remained silent on the issue of decriminalization of homelessness, while it is an important success on many other fronts. Given the continued difficulties to decriminalize homelessness and petty offenses at the local, national, international levels, the contribution of regional human rights mechanisms to overcome the use of criminal law for petty offenses must be lauded. The principles on the decriminalization of petty offenses in Africa adopted in 2017 by the African Commission on People and Peoples and Human Rights, the advisory opinion of the African Court on Human and People's Rights adopted in 2002, which states that various vagrancy laws which continue to be enforced in many African countries since colonial times, prohibiting begging, staying or sleeping in public places, are incompatible with human rights law binding on their states. The ruling by the European Court of Human Rights in 2021 in the case of Lacatus versus Switzerland are examples that could be noted here. Despite this judgment of the European Court, criminalization of homelessness remains a serious concern in Europe and elsewhere. On 2nd February 2022, for example, the Danish Supreme Court sentenced a Lithuanian citizen to 60 days unconditional imprisonment for begging. Since 2017, changes in the Danish Penal Code have contributed to increasing criminalization of the presence of homeless people in public spaces. Strongly condemned by civil society, the inhumane policies introduce restrictions on sleeping rough and increase punishment for begging. There is prima facie a strongly xenophobic element to this legislation. 
In debates introducing the new sanctions, it was openly stated that the aim of these policies is to target non-Danish citizens living homeless on the streets of Denmark. The figures so far confirm this as well. From 94 convictions under paragraph 197 of the Penal Code, 91 were of non-Danes. Against this overall background, the current Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, Olivier Descouter, and myself, sent a letter first to all Council of Europe states, later as well to all UN member states, asking them about progress in decriminalizing homelessness and persons living in extreme poverty, referring to the UN guidelines that I referred to. Responses to this call for input, which would lead to joint report by us both, has been impressive. In total, we have received almost 100 submissions from states, local governance associations, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, and academics, which are now accessible on our respective websites. We are in the process of engaging in a full analysis of all the responses received, but it is already clear that the overall picture that I have just outlined to you thus far remains the case. The situation in most countries is far from satisfactory. I therefore strongly welcome this opportunity to unambiguously advocate what we can further do in our efforts to end homelessness and the criminalization of petty offenses, homelessness, and poverty. Thank you again for this opportunity to share my views. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Raja Gopal. I know you don't have time uh, for questions, right? Uh, because uh, he has a flight to catch and we were being a bit late. Um, so I'm sure we will be able to discuss uh, further over drinks. And with the online audience, thank you again for joining. And perhaps we will see you on another occasion. Thank you.